I know in the past few weeks, Live Nation and I think AEG as well were saying that they were looking forward to a full normal summer and fall for uh, mm. for touring and for and for big shows. Uh, I think that that might be a little hopeful personally. I'm kind of slating my educated guess for like late 2021, so like into the fall. Um, that's kind of what I was uh, kind of slating here. Hopefully that's yeah. the case because I know there's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of artists who are really and not just artists, you know, crews and um, you know everyone yeah. across the industry that's really relying on the touring income to come back. You are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice. I'm Corinne. With me is Jack. We are about to welcome in 2021. How excited are you, Jack? I'm excited. Sayonara 2020. Hello 2021. We're all like on this hopes and dreams boat of like, oh, (laughs) January 1st, we're going to start all over. It's like, well, (laughs) uh, we shall see what's actually ready for us in 2021. But Jack and I have some great predictions for the next year and hopefully not too many of them rely on the clearance of a certain friend, our virus that will remain unnamed. Uh, (laughs) But so we have that for you today. But before we dig in, I wanted to make a couple of announcements uh, because two of my babies are growing up and I'm so excited. So obviously you've heard a lot about Indie Founder on uh, this podcast, but we have revamped Founder for 2021 and to make it even more about coaching. So we have multiple levels now which is, you know, for different people at different levels. And they range from four to 10 weeks. And each of these, you go through coaching, we dump a lot of knowledge in your brain, but at the end, you submit all of this information that you've been working on for the past few weeks. And a coach will actually look at all of your answers and create an executable plan of action for you to follow up based exclusively on your current place. So uh, that's something that a lot of our previous founders requested was to get a little bit more feedback and more, basically more guidance into what they should do when the founder session is done. And so we have put that into place. So if you're interested in that, that's at entrepreneur.io slash services. And you can click on the founder there to take our placement quiz. And it's super fun because, you know, are you a, like, are you a lion spirit or a seal spirit? Have what's, you ever taken any of the? <laughs> <laughs> what's your, what's your super secret Zodiac? Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Or any kind of cosmopolitan quiz. Do people even take those anymore? I don't even know. So that is one big announcement. And the second big announcement, which I am super excited for, because this is the stuff I really love, obviously full stack merch is a branch of entrepreneur that I've been heading up and we are now launching tech stack builds. So specifically focused on e-commerce. So if you've been trying to get that WooCommerce store, that Shopify store, WooFunnels, ThriveCart, like if you're trying to get your funnels running and you just are caught up in the tech, we can help you with that. Uh, We're going to obviously be specializing in e-com. IndieX has all of the other services available, (laughs) but we're going to be doing just one-off builds. So if you want a Shopify store built, it's going to be super easy and done in a couple of days with us. So uh, again, that is at entrepreneur.io slash services. So there's a little application you fill out and we can let you know if it's a good fit for you and your goals. So Had to get those out there. Sorry for the plugs, but I'm super excited because both of these programs are going into 2021 with a swift kick in the ass. (laughs) I'm super excited too. One more little announcement going into 2021. (laughs) We are opening up some more slots at IndieX and I am super excited to talk to some artists that might, you know, need a little bit of extra help, um, on their digital marketing. Um, so if you are looking to crush into 2021 and, you know, really maximize what you've been doing up until this point, uh, you can go through the application process at that same page, entrepreneur.io slash services and check out IndieX. We're going to be opening up some slots shortly into the new year. So 
feel free to submit an application. We'll take a look at it. We'll set you up with a consultation with me to talk about your goals if we think it's a good fit and uh, and see if working together might make sense based on what you're looking to do. So that is the one little plug for me. Um, we've been working <laughs> with a lot of really great artists and uh, looking to bring some new folks on board to our roster. So if you're looking to expand your team, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Nice. This episode of Creative Juice was brought to you by Entrepreneur Services. <laughs> <laughs> All the things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think for Entrepreneur, we are super stoked for not only what Entrepreneur is doing and planning for in 2021, but also what indies across the globe are planning for. And I think so many of us have just been waiting for this cloud to lift. And, you know, the only way that we can get that cloud to lift is through positive thought maybe a vaccine. So (laughs) Jack and I have put together some predictions and hopes and dreams for 2021. So hopefully you are ready to take a listen to that and maybe you'll agree and maybe you'll think of things that we haven't thought of yet. So Jack, you want to go first? You ready to dive in? Yeah, let's get into it. All right, let's do this. I'm going to kick off with the, uh, with the obvious prediction and hopefully educated guess here that we will start seeing the return of live music in late 2021 um, with, you know, hopeful vaccinations going out for, uh, for coronavirus kind of as we wrap up 2020 here. Um, hopefully as, you know, that starts to reach the front lines, we can start seeing, you know, the touring industry open up uh, again, shortly. I know in the past few weeks, Live Nation and I think AEG as well were saying that they were looking forward to a full normal summer and fall for uh, mm. for touring and for and for big shows. Uh, I think that that might be a little hopeful. Personally, I'm kind of slating my educated guess for like late 2021, so like into the fall. Um, that's kind of what I was. Uh, kind of slating here hopefully that's the case because i know there's a lot of a lot of uh a lot of artists who are really and not just artists you know crews and um you know everyone across the industry that's really relying on the touring income to come back so uh i really hope to that we see that both for you know artists that are at the at the largest levels but also for indies um who i think might see an advantage uh when things do start to uh you know really start to churn back into the back into life when it comes to live music. Um, I think indies yeah, will have people a, be itching yeah, so <laughs> for I that think live indie, music. Yeah. So I think indies will have an advantage in, in, you know, smaller venues and maybe even non-traditional venues to really do some cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think if anyone wants to be touring in 2021, I tell you, it's me. Uh, I just, I, I canceled a UK Denmark, Germany tour in 2020, which in spring 2020, which was such a drag. And so all those fans are clamoring. And, you know, now my US base is also starting to get cranky. (laughs) Um, And I'm releasing a new rock album next year. So I definitely would love for that to be cleared. My prediction, though, is that it won't be. We're at at we're at odds here. I'm taking the I know. I'm taking the optimistic. You're taking the pessimistic. It's good. Well, it's realistic because you know I I don't want to book a tour and lose a bunch of money. <laughs> you sure. know, and I think there's a lot of us who you know when we talk about independent touring and independent shows, like canceling a show is you know it's just a really bad financial situation to be in. And, you know, especially if some states are letting us do things and some states aren't, you know, if you have one night off that you weren't expecting, it can bring the whole tour into the red. Like it's just, you know, it's, it's a killer. So my prediction is, you know, it's still optimistic. It's just that we might be learning new ways to, you know, provide live music. And I think that, you know, virtual shows full band virtual shows uh, are things that I've seen just start to pop up. I think it might start becoming more and more mainstream, at least for the first half of the year. Um, And, you know, hopefully that'll satiate some people into live music, but I I don't know. I mean, I would love to be proven wrong. I just feel like um, 
I, I feel like it might take a little bit longer than everybody's wanting. Yeah. And, and I, I honestly agree with you, to be honest. You know, I think my, <laughs> I think my, I think my prediction here is, is more nuanced than, than I let on initially. I don't think that we're going to see a normal reopening per se. I think we're going to see the return of live shows and touring, but I don't think yeah. it's going to be you know, like it was in 2019, for example, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to be quite the same. I don't think a lot of things are going to be the same after any of what we've ever again. Yeah. Yeah. What we've had happen this year. So I think we'll see a return. I don't think it will be, you know, what anyone could expect in their mind that it's going to be. Right. Well, and you know, something we could see come out of this is decreased capacity in certain venues which, you know, for artists who aren't selling out rooms on a regular basis, this might actually be a good thing, you know, where the booking agent isn't having to promise as big numbers. Or if you're speaking to a promoter directly, uh, that promoter is not expecting as many numbers, you know, and this may actually open up stage space for those who have a smaller draw than maybe would otherwise have played that venue. So, you know, there is some positive that could come out of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mm -hmm. I think, I think that pretty much sums it up. (laughs) That's my, (laughs) that's my, that's my first prediction. Was that also yours? I, well, first, yeah, sure. (laughs) (laughs) Well, awesome. We, we, I think, I feel like we took out the elephant in the room. That was, that was the first one that I wanted to touch on to be like, let's get this one out of the way. Because we know it's a thing. (laughs) Yeah. And people want to know, you know? Absolutely. Awesome. Well, my next prediction has a little bit to do with live shows, live music. And it's about, you know, what you mentioned, Corinne, like the alternate ways that people have been getting live music, getting their live music kicks, um, you know, with virtual concerts and live streams. And I think what we're going to see in 2021 is, (laughs) if it hasn't happened already, is the saturation of, you know, paid and free live stream concerts. And right. What I mean by that is not that it's going to be saturated and that like everyone's going to be doing it, but I think that so many artists are doing it. And even some of my favorite artists that like I didn't expect to be doing it are now doing it, that I think it's going to get to a point that if you want to do it, if you want to be using that either as monetization or just engagement, that you're going to need to, you know, really pull off some pretty cool stunts to make it stand out from the noise. Um, Mm -hmm. that is my, that's kind of my viewpoint and my prediction on what it means for it to be saturated. I don't think people are going to stop caring about it, but there's going to be a lot of friction to get people to say, well, why should I do this instead of seeing, you know, uh, you know, why should I check out Corinne's live stream versus, I don't know, uh, seven dust or something like that. You know, hey, I'm better than seven dust. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, don't come for me. <laughs> there, well, there you go. What, what are artists going to do to make, to, to you know, constantly one up themselves and differentiate when it comes to that space? I think that's going to be really important. Yeah. And I mean, spinning off that and kind of taking some inspo from my last one, I think that expectations of live streams are also going to go up. Right. Because as live streams become more frequent and more, you know, professionally produced by these bigger bands that are not used to having to go live, you know, they're not going to want to be as vulnerable as an as exposed. But I have a feeling that management and labels is going to start being like, okay, when these venues aren't opening up, when things aren't you know open for business as fast as we would like, it's going to be on the artists to do something else. And I I think that they're going to get some pressure from their people to live stream. And they're not used to being vulnerable. They're used to their live, you know, full hall auto tune and (laughs) all the forgiveness of verb and everything. So um, it could rise the standard as far as to, you know, as far as production of going live and doing streams. Um, You know, Bonnaroo has been doing live streams even prior to the pandemic. And, you know, I think more and more people have started to expect higher, higher quality event streaming. Um, if you look at, you know, the Grammys last year or, um, you know, the country music awards or any of any of the award shows, right. Um, they were all very, they were online based. They assumed there would be no public audience and those were produced very, very well. Um, so I think that there will be some bars risen in that department. And so Indies may have to, you know, rely on something besides 
the typical sit in front of the camera and play. And that's not to say that it needs to look professionally produced like the production team at the Grammys Awards, <laughs> but you may have to be more creative and kind of what Jack's saying is like, find something that is unique to you that makes people still respect what you're doing on that live stream. Um, and that really differentiates you from other options out there. Yeah, I think really aiming to make it an event, you know, um, right. Give people a reason to hang out with you on whatever, you know, a Thursday night or, or something like that. There also might be mm. adaptations to make about when these, these are timed for, um, mm. you know, right now, a lot of what I've seen both at Indie X and just, you know, in the, in the wild, um, have been artists <laughs> having, having their live streams on Friday nights or Saturday nights. But as the rest of the world kind of loosens up a little bit, as we go into the year more and more, um, I think that those, you know, those Friday night and Saturday night spots, those might be taken up by other things that people traditionally do on Friday nights and Saturday nights. And to get them to hang out with you on their couch, you're going to really have to make it enticing and make it cool. Um, yeah, I agree. So that applies to whether you're trying to do it on a Friday night or a weeknight or whatever it is. Um, right. But I do, th I do think that it's important. Um, I was talking with one of our NDX clients about this uh, earlier in the week and you know, he was telling me, man, like some of the, some of the big bands that I listen to are, they're hosting these quote unquote virtual concerts and they're pre-recording them. And he just, you know, was railing against it <laughs> on our call and just being like, I think it's so lame, like such a big thumbs down, like what a missed opportunity to do something cool. And I'm like, good, take that, take that passion. And like, you know, harness it into making something cool for what you guys are doing. Um, Absolutely. Because your fans will love you for it. Right. Well, and that does speak to the same thing, right? Since, you know, a lot of these bands are used to being edited, even as they play live, they're not going to be comfortable just sitting in front of the camera and being super vulnerable. And so it probably will result in a lot of these larger outlets using these, you know, look live, but be pre-streamed and pre-edited stuff, you know? Um, yeah. so there, there probably will be an advantage to those who are very clearly live. Um, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult to see what happens. It, I always think that the major music industry is about to catch up with our indies. I always think that we're on the precipice of that and then they never do. So, you know, I mean, I'm making yeah. this prediction, but it's definitely with the awareness that sometimes that's just a little too, I'm giving them a little too much of the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So one of my predictions for 2021 is that we are going to see a rise in crowdfunding and Kickstarter style campaigns um, as, as musicians come out of the woodwork and they're getting back into life and they've had, you know, a year to 18 months where they have not had to a revenue generating and stuff, I think that there's going to be a rise in that kind of thing. Um, and I actually, I mean, I think that's great, but at the same time, if you're planning a crowdfunding campaign in early 2021, especially like quarter two, I think that we're going to start seeing some competition on that front. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I, I think we've been seeing, you know, whispers of that. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've even in the past two months, like kind of trailing off Q4 here a little bit, I've started to see, you know, pre-order campaigns or crowdfunding campaigns starting to pop up, not with any of our clients at IndieX in particular, but just seeing artists that I know of doing mm -hmm. it. So I, I am really curious to see if that uh, prediction comes to fruition. Yeah. Well, I'm launching mine in about a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Awesome. <laughs> so, well, I'm trying to get ahead of the curve, man. <laughs> yeah. But as soon as I started to see, you know, murmurs of that, like in conversations with my friends who are in other bands or, you know, just kind of, I don't know, taking a temperature on this, I just started to feel like, I was like, I need to get ahead of this. I don't, you know, it could be totally wrong, but I think that there's a lot of people trying to recover. I mean, I, I have a ton of friends who are you know, on the crew that have been touring with the same bands for years and, you know, trying to find other work, like yeah. let alone not even, it's not even like they can hop to another band. I mean, they're just, their skills are not being used in the present environment. Um, so, you know, I've been seeing people crowdfunding for troops of, of crew that are essentially like, Hey, there's these people, they've done this work 
And they're actually, you know, crowdfunding their own salaries at this point from people yeah. who are generous enough to donate. So, um, but I do think I see, you know, contrary to thinking I would see it more at the end of 2020, I think we'll see more of it in early 2021 when there's a realization that like, wow, this isn't going away yet. You know, um, I think we're all going to hit kind of a brick wall when 2021 hits and it's not a miracle different year. You know, um, And I think the reality is going to sink in for some, some of these bands and some of the people in this industry. So um, I do expect that to impact a lot of change. And one of them I think will be a rising crowdfunding. Yeah, I guess we'll see. I'm I'm going to be keeping track of this as we uh as we mar- march on into the coming months. I'm always guys, I'm always wrong. Like me and Cirque, we used to do this. We would do <laughs> predictions for the next year and Cirque would predict the future and I would be like, I think these things and like none of them would happen. So don't worry. I'm probably full of it. Don't even don't even worry about it. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. Well, I have a a prediction that I think kind of ties into that a little bit. Um, And that is that I think in 2021, we're going to see even more of a widespread adoption of artists using one-to-one communication channels to talk with their fans. Um, I like that prediction. You know I like that prediction. (laughs) I I love that prediction. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And a lot of my thinking behind this one comes from really two places. One, um, at at our agency at NDX, we've seen, I mean, and even I've personally seen with the clients that I directly work with, um, I've seen more and more of our artists and their managers and their teams begin to see the value in list building, whether it be email mm. list building or text list building, whatever it might be. You're the, sure that's not the, just your influence? <laughs> I mean, it, it very well might be my, just my influence. <laughs> However, I am far less pushy on the clients than I am on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I'm far less pushy with people. Um, I'm actually a real softy. I'm real nice. I, I know you guys probably don't believe it, but <laughs> it's true. guys. Um, I've seen it not yeah. frequently, but I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, the conversations that have come up at NDX have been really, uh, you know, pretty enlightening where I've, I've left a lot of meetings smiling to be like, oh, yes, it's clicking. You're getting it. Yeah, they're um, getting whether, it. <laughs> yeah. Whether that be engagement that's coming from, you know, email marketing that's happening or SMS marketing that's happening or uh, especially revenue that's been generated through uh, one to one channels this year has been really, really uh eye-opening for a lot of artists uh, that we work with. So, you know, from an internal experience, I kind of see us as the uh, the inspiration microcosm for why I have this, uh, why I have this prediction, but I'm also seeing it kind of widely out there with the adoption of SMS marketing. That's been a big thing for a lot of artists. You know, I see a lot of, a lot of people using the, uh, the app community uh, for their yeah, SMS marketing. I've seen that a too. Lot of, A lot of artists using it, bands using it, influencers, uh, YouTubers, you name it. Um, And that's just one, you know, one app for SMS marketing. There's, you know, tons of them out there. But I've definitely seen more and more of it pop up in 2020. And I think that we're going to see more, even more widespread adoption of that this year. And hopefully to everybody's benefit, because permission is badass <laughs> and right. one-to-one communication works really, really well. Totally. Well, and that's another situation where potentially the bar will be raised, right? And Indies will always rise above that bar and I'm sure of it, but we might have to work a little harder if, you know, regular industry standard musicians are starting to, you know, adopt this kind of more personal engagement with their people. Yeah. You better make those bribes gosh darn good, guys. Make them good, guys. (laughs) Yeah, you got to make those bribes awesome. You got to stand out. It can't just be, text my number. Text my number for what? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I hope we see that in 2021. Yeah, I'd love to see that too. All right, Jack, I want to know what you think about this. Hit me. I think that as things open up, we will see higher CPM in social advertising. Ooh, you know, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think the inventory is going to shrink maybe a little faster than we were, than we would expect. 
and that, you know, people will be vying harder for those eyeballs. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. And I think the reason behind this is throughout 2020, you know, businesses of all kinds have been hurting. And Mm -hmm. what do businesses do uh, in my experience when they don't have money is the first thing that they pull their budget from is marketing. So those ad dollars that they're spending, not anymore, which is counterproductive to what you should do. I don't need to, I probably don't need to preach about this on the podcast, but (laughs) if you need customers, you need to spend money to get customers. If you need sales, you should be spending money on your marketing to bring those sales in. Otherwise your pipeline dries up, dries up, whatever it is you're selling. But I digress. I don't want to get on a soapbox. (laughs) Um, But my reason in saying that is when, you know, things start to open up and, you know, business as usual kind of starts to come back, that money will be there again to be allocated towards marketing and Mm -hmm. people are going to spend on Facebook ads. So yeah, the CPMs are going to go up. Inventory is going to go down. I totally agree with that one. I'm expecting it. I mean, I kind of think that we could potentially be on our phones less than, you know, and I I, maybe I should say it this way. Our engagement with our phones may degrade at a higher rate than it increased in relation, you know, over the past certain period of time, because as more yeah. and more technology has become available to more and more people, right. It's more and more affordable and we've had more and more time, you know, can't go outside. So the combination of, you know, being able to go outside and do things with your life, but also just the appreciation of that And like when you're at dinner with friends, like, do you get off your phone because, oh my gosh, you're having dinner with friends for once. And like, who knows how long that will last. But I think that's something that we could actually see, you know, a a psyche shift in how people use their mobile devices. And that impacts our mobile placements and the inventory available for advertising. And so I, I think it could be more competitive. Now, don't everybody panic and be like, are CPMs really high or is it just me or whatever? You know, I don't think it's going to be so drastic to the point where like advertising is just too cost prohibitive, (laughs) you know, period. Um, But yeah, I I do think that we're going to not only see a different difference in supply and demand of advertising, but also, you know, more distinctly how people engage on their phones. Like maybe at our shows, fewer people will be on their phones, you know, or maybe they'll be capturing it more aggressively. I mean, it's hard to know how that will impact uh, us socially. You raised such a good point there, like not just about CPMs, but how a psyche shift in how we use mobile devices or rather when we use mobile devices and how engaged we are with like real physical human social interaction. Will we be on our phones when we're at dinner or out with friends or at concerts? I think not only how that will impact ad inventory and costs, but how that will impact, you know, engagement and buying, you know, buying intent. Um, yeah. I, I wasn't predicting this, but now that you mention it, you yeah. know, there's a case to be made that we might see a massive dip in engagement through advertising and buying intent through advertising that mm-hmm. if people just aren't using, and then when they are, they're kind of just like doing the scroll and thinking that they'll go back to something later. Um, that could be a, a massive difference compared to the like e-commerce spike that we've seen right. in 2020. Yeah, definitely. Like I'll definitely Ooh, be watching. That's fascinating. Yeah. I'll, well, I was thinking about it because I'm still running that, you know, pay what you want sh- shipping and handling funnel to cold. And I remember thinking earlier in the year this could only be working because we're in a pandemic and people are stuck inside. And so they're buying to feed their sadness. And, you know, I mean, as much as I want to think that my music is just amazing and everyone wants to buy it. um, I did think, you know, I think that there's something timely about what's happening here. And, you know, it's difficult to gauge because obviously, you know, from black Friday through the holidays, people are just bombarded with, email and uh, marketing ads and they're buying things and they're out of money, you know, because (laughs) there's only so much you can spend. Um, So we'll see how it fares in the beginning of 2021, but I'm definitely poised and ready to hang that strategy up on a hook, you know, and maybe it won't work the same way because the world is changing. So I won't be super sad when that happens. That's fine. 
you know, and we roll on doing all the other things we always do. But yeah. um, it is something that I was thinking. That's why it kind of came into my head is because I was thinking about this long term strategy and how I've been seeing less of a return in the holiday season and, um, you know, wondering how much of that is impacted by, you know, different states opening back up or stuff like that. Totally. Yeah. That's a great point. But don't everybody well, go panic and post in the group and we're not, there's no panic button here. Okay. We're fine. We're all fine. Yeah. We all know exactly what we need to do next. And that is nurture the hell out of those fans. <laughs> there's been enough panic in 2020 that I'm hoping that none of these predictions uh, cause, <laughs> cause more any panic. panic. <laughs> I know. I almost didn't bring this one up though, because I was like, man, now, I, now the whole year of 2021, everyone's going to be like, CPMs are higher because Crin said this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I so. think I think it'll be really interesting to see. But again, you know, these are just our guesstimates and predictions. Yep. Well, that's my guess. Yeah. Well, I've got an interesting talking about engagement. Um, I think one prediction that I think we're going to see come to fruition, maybe slowly. Uh, this isn't going to be like as widespread adoption as uh, like one-to-one -one channels, but something that I do think we're going to see more of as we go into 2021 and the rest of the 2020s is more like experiential engagement yes. opportunities with fans to really help artists Oh, he took well, mine. Ah, <laughs> nice. We have common ground to talk about. Um, <laughs> love it. You know, you think about things like VR and AR and even, you know, machine learning, uh, world building. We, you know, we've talked extensively about what Travis Scott did. Um, right. The, the in-game concert. Um, I think we're going to see more stuff like that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be virtual reality, but more experiential based marketing. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and I have been thinking that like, <laughs> because I don't have enough to do. Um, I've been going <laughs> through, <laughs> I've been going through an XD training because um, I want to start building my app um, for my artistry. And I, I had one a long time ago, but it was basically like a website with buttons in an app. <laughs> like it, it wasn't anything. And there was a music player, like it wasn't anything substantial. Um, but I actually started working on, like I storyboarded kind of a game slash environment for my people, um, where it's, you know, a bit of a choose your own adventure, but it's also bringing in all of the elements that are available to them through my membership site and, you know, the Gilded experience and many chat points, but other loyalty programs and stuff like that. Um, and the whole idea was to make it more of a, in my world kind of place to live, um, so that cool. isn't a website. Yeah. Well, we'll see if I can figure it out. <laughs> it took me years to build my membership site. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not announcing a release anytime soon, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that things are going to go more and more in that direction. Um, but I also think that technology will start offering us more ways to do that at a consumer level, right? Um, when we've talked about the Travis Scott performance, we've said there's no way an indie artist could achieve that level of production. But I think that there will be more and more technology that starts to support that. There just hasn't been as much of a need for it prior to now. So if tech companies are smart, just the way that, you know, musical instruments and musical equipment has, you know, now there's the professional gear, but there's also really good gear that's considered consumer level, but it, but it's not, you know, uh, yeah. I think that, you know, virtual reality and 360 cameras and all of those pieces of tech that enable you to produce that kind of content. I think that they'll start shifting to more of a consumer level so that you can do it without spending tens of thousands of dollars on a setup. Totally. It's the same model that we see with, you know, that we've seen with recording equipment. You know, we mm -hmm. went from like, it cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a studio to then right. more, more consumer or more professional friendly gear that was cheaper. And then getting into like prosumer and consumer level gear that was super yep. affordable to, you know, to, for people to build amazing sounding home studios. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think you're totally right. We're going to see that same, you know, concept apply to the tech behind more of this experiential 
stuff <laughs> right. that you could do. I, I don't even want to call it experiential marketing because it's it's so much. It can be so much more than just that. Um, right. Yeah, totally. And you know, when I was writing this one down, something that came to my mind was like, for a lot of people who hear this, they probably are like, I could never, like, I can't get into that. Like, that's too much. Like it costs right. too much. It's too involved. But I've seen indies do it. Um, and businesses do it in ways that are really tasteful and just fit where they're at. I'm thinking of a, of an indie in, in our community, um, RJ Thompson, who just put together this amazing record launch, um, doing like vinyl with, uh, an AR experience through an app, uh, just like a really, really cool campaign that he ran this year. And that was kind of yeah. what inspi- inspired me at the indie level um, to look at, you know, like you've got Travis Scott, this massive artist who put together this incredible thing, this world. <laughs> and then well, you've got in indie- partnership with a giant first person of course. world experience platform. Of course. <laughs> like, yeah, of course. Yeah. A little bit of help there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what I mean by that is like, an artist like that has the leverage and the connections to do that with the, with the third parties and, right. the, and, and the assistance. Whereas an indie, you know, might be going it alone, but it can be done and there are cool ways yeah. to do it. Um, Absolutely. Well, you know, a few years ago, even one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite graphic artists, um, a, a local guy named David McComer, he did a number of, uh, a number of paintings, uh, prints and, uh, canvases that he ha- had an app created for them and they moved in AR. It was super cool. My brother bought oh, one. Wow. <laughs> um, they're amazing. Yeah. Like really, really cool stuff. So I think we're going to see more and more of, you know, people starting to dip their toes into those waters. And I really hope we do. Cause I think it's just amazing. Super creative. Absolutely. Well, you know, there's like, um, what, what, uh, there's this glasses company. I think it's Warby Parker but they currently have um, an app where essentially you can try on their glasses, you know, through AR. Yeah, yeah. And there's different retailers who have done that. Like, okay, here's this piece of equipment or here's this thing that has kind of, you know, you don't really know what how it's going to fit into your home. There are certain decor retailers that have done this. There are tech retailers that have done this. Essentially, it's like put up your phone and you can and point it at where you would be putting it and you can yeah. test these things out before you even buy them. Furniture, yeah. paint, you know, yeah, we bought, a, we bought a we bought a plant stand and did that to, yeah. <laughs> to see where it would fit in our living room. Exactly. So, you know, there are fun ways that you could spin off of that um, that obviously aren't that complex because even these companies are doing it. I think, you know, they just paid a person or paid a company who knows how to do it. But in theory, these things could become more widespread available and therefore more affordable, which means Indies could find some really creative stuff to do with it. Yeah, totally. I think it's only a matter of time before it, like you said, kind of reaches a tipping point where it becomes readily available for people to use. And then all they need to do is plug in their creative brain and you know, you're off to the races. Yeah, I agree. I just, I keep predicting that, the major music industry is going to catch up and um, they're going to start figuring stuff out. And I do know a couple label people who are starting to think more about being a B to C company, which is business to, you know, consumer. And a lot of the stuff that they've done in the past is very B to B, right? Which is very much like, oh, we're shopping this artist, this agent, and this promoter, and this retail company. And like those people concentrate on the consumer from there. And I've been seeing some major label artists get more into direct to consumer marketing and figure out how to build their store in a way that, you know, they're retargeting their people and they're making more personal experiences. They're surveying their people to find out more about what kind of merch they want. You know, Um, they're really kind of mind sourcing their, their people. And so I think that there will be more competition with the things that, you know, we have been taking for granted because the industry doesn't have that tour revenue. You know, if you look at the revenue historically for the music industry, um, you know, a big portion of it is streaming uh, because they own Spotify and the other, the big three own Spotify in case anyone's forgetting. So they make plenty of money there. um, And then touring, 
touring is their bread and butter and that's gone away. So some of them have adapted well and some of them have lost their ass. But if you look at the the reports for 2020 and how the music industry is doing, they have not lost as much as you would expect. And that's because they are pivoting and coming over to our side of the fence. And even though they may not be doing it well, they're doing it, which means, you know, our eyeballs are being swiped by these major artists. So yeah. I do think that, you know, it's going to be even more important for us to have these really great, like you were talking about earlier, Jack, these one-to-one relationships with our fans, um, you know, really pouring ourselves into merch. I don't, you know, I don't personally think that a tee with a logo on it is even okay right now, but it especially won't be next year uh, because these bigger artists with more resources are getting smarter and smarter about how to make money online because they've been forced into only being able to do that. Yeah. I I think that's a really interesting point. I, I pause to think that, you know, I've been saying in a lot of ways that everything that happened during 2020, especially COVID um, has kind of accelerated stuff that was already going on and moving, you know? Yeah. And I, I do wonder if, if this prediction and that trend is something that, yeah, w- w- is accelerated because I do think that the music industry as a whole is moving in that direction in in being more focused on B to C mm-hmm. and and as it should be, you know, like right. Um, that's kind of like what we've been cheering on and trying to spur. Um, and I think the indie movement has been, you know, rocking towards that for quite a long time. Definitely. But yeah, the, it. I do wonder if if you know everything that happened this year kind of just pushed that along on a, on a little bit of a faster pace. Right. Well, and you know, I've talked about my experience with the government and especially the U S army, obviously. And I've always said, you know, they don't pivot quickly. They're a battleship. They have to plan. They really have to turn the wheel so many times to move one degree. And, um, but one thing that they definitely get motivated by is when Senate won't vote on their budget. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And all of a sudden you see them pivot a lot faster. And I think that's what's happening in the music industry as well. You've got these giants who, you know, just through all the bureaucracy and the paperwork and, you know, legal responsibilities don't have the option to pivot so quickly. And, you know, what they've been doing is buying out more and more sub labels that can pivot more quickly. And they, even at the high scale, have been pivoting faster because they have to, because otherwise they'll go under, you know? And so you see the motivation for those pivots start to come out and, and they get a little bit of a fire under their butt, which I mean, it's good. They should, this industry is broken. Um, but as Indies, you know, there's a friendly con like for me, there's this huge conflict because I want the music industry by and large to be better, you know? And then part of me as an independent artist is like, yeah, but you know, we can, do all these things and people are surprised by it or, you know, haven't seen that kind of offer before because the major artists aren't doing it. So, and I'm kind of cheering for both and conflicted about it. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a, that's a good point too, is like, I think there's a caution here for indies that like, if you're hearing this, like, there's going to come a time that like taking the easy way out or cutting corners, especially when it comes to like the relationships that you're nurturing with your fans and your marketing that like cutting corners won't do it anymore. Like, and that's going to happen when there's massive adoption of, you know, a lot of the direct to consumer and direct to fan stuff that we Mm -hmm. talk about. Right. Well, and one thing to give all of you a, you know, a little beacon of hope in this (laughs) is that something that cannot be replicated and generated is authenticity and vulnerability. And big artists are always going to, even if they don't have trouble like doing it on their socials, they're going to have trouble delivering it in that way because the people who manage them are going to, there's going to be barriers between them and the place where they could be putting that out. And we still have access to that as indies uh, because we can just decide, we can just do it because we want to. Um, So I would say, you know, don't worry as much about the production level of things. Um, Just worry about whether you're being honest and vulnerable and authentic with people 
And I think that will be generating fans that are also, you know, the kinds of people who tout support small business stickers on their bumper, you know, yeah. um, and really find your troop. And, you know, if, if that means that you look less like the commercial industry, so be it. But that will be, have to be the way now that you differentiate yourself versus, you know, just trying to look like them, but then having cool strategies that they're not using. <laughs> That's so good. That's so damn good. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, it's so, it's so true. Like, yeah, yeah. Th- I think, I think it is, an, it's an intersection. Oh man. Uh, it, it triggered. Oh um, no. <laughs> triggered it's it is going to be an intersection of like okay stop trying to look like the thing that isn't doing it right right and embrace embrace what you are yeah and embrace and embrace how you do it fully yes I couldn't agree with you more I hope what it will do is actually you know I I would like indies to be inspired to not like hopefully it'll pull you even further away from those vanity metrics you know and further away from the things that don't matter and just know that the thing that's going to make you competitive again is not these strategies that we've been doing that have been outmaneuvering the commercial industry. What's going to sell you now is the fact that they would rather go to their local coffee shop than go to Starbucks, you know? And that is what you want to generate in your music as well. And if you start generating that loyalty now, you're getting ahead, right? And if you have that little, that little crew that can, you know, ascend to the advocacy stage of your buddy system, people who are already there for it, for you, for everything, you know, though that will then be contagious, right? So if you've not yet garnered that kind of relationship with your fans, do it now, because I think you'll be getting ahead of the curve and they will spread, you know, here we are talking about not spreading viruses, um, but they will spread that energy to new people in your clan. uh, And that is just something that cannot be broken unless you break it. Yeah. 100 times. Yes. <laughs> I love, I love it. I love it. I love my indies. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh man. Well, I have one more, Okay. one more prediction for 2021. Some people probably aren't going to love this one all that much. Oh no. Um, and it's so- something we don't talk about too much on the podcast. Uh, but I think what we're going to see is that the gold rush mentality of TikTok is going to die down. It's, it didn't already. <laughs> One could only, one could only wish it did, it did for already. me on day one, <laughs> yeah. but I'm an old fart. <laughs> me, so don't listen to me. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> but Crumbly I do, old Scrooge I think, over here. I think at a, you know, a zoomed out level for a lot of people, the gold rush mentality is going to die down as the platform is, you know, saturated more and more. And mm-hmm. I think the focus is going to shift to consistent platforms for awareness. I think that's going to be critical. Um, Mm. and what do I mean by consistent platforms? I mean, places where, you know, we've seen awareness get generated time and time again in predictable ways. Um, so that could be Facebook and Instagram ads. It could be, you know, your YouTube channel. It could even be TikTok. you know? Um, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that TikTok is going to go away or it's not going to be useful anymore, but I think the, I want to blow up on TikTok because, I need to get ahead of everybody else who's trying to blow up on TikTok. Right. That's going to go away. I, God, I hope it's going to go away. <laughs> um, but I think the focus on consistency is going to reign supreme. That's funny. That kind of ties into a prediction that I have, which is not necessarily, you know, anything about any specific platform, although TikTok is one of the easiest to identify. But I think that we're slowly going to be seeing enough social progress as far as, you know, apps and different communities where people can like Facebook is obviously still king, right? Even though like, you know, now Congress is trying to split up Facebook and Instagram and you know, right. There's always this political uh, mess. Boo hoo. We'll, we'll see about that. <laughs> okay. No politics, boy. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that there are certain social platforms that will always be king or, you know, will probably stay king slash queen. But um, I also think that, you know, inventiveness is going to come out of this period where, you know, really cool developers like Mark Zuck when he was young have been sitting in their basements for the last year and they've had a ton of time to work on things. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, what's what's the one um, that Trump uses now instead of Twitter? Parlor. Parlor. We've seen Parlor come up. 
obviously TikTok has been coming up there. You know, there are tons of places now where different people can segment themselves into different social situations and different social groups. And I think that's going to rapidly increase over the next year to the point where you wouldn't be able to gold rush everything because like there's going to be too much available. Right. And so what I hope it'll do is kind of level the playing field a bit. Um, you know, cause if you remember before TikTok, Snapchat was where all the kids were now TikTok's where all the kids are, right. As the old people yep. talk about marketing, right. Cause apparently yep. the kids is the place who they want to target. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think eventually there's going to be enough available where there isn't any one said platform. And instead we're going to have to look at these different platforms and view, okay, what kind of content is popular on this on these different platforms and what kind of content do I want to make and what, yeah. what, where is that going to be most popular? I'm going to invest my time there because you're not just going to be able to chase a platform anymore. You're going to have to look at how do people consume content on these channels and which of them, re, you know, really resonates with the way I want to create content the most, which is really what yeah. we should be doing anyway. But I think when there's too many options, you'll be forced to look at it that way. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think, you know, in addition to the question of what kind of content is good on this platform, mm -hmm. what kind of content do I like to create? I think the third question that's going to fall in this, you know, kind of range of thinking is where do my people really hang out? Right. I think like the rubber is going to meet the road where artists are going to have to ask themselves that and actually answer it. Mm -hmm. And stop trying to figure out like, how do I move my Facebook people to YouTube? Right. Or like, how do I get, how do I get people on Twitter to go to my Instagram? Right. The, the focus will stop being on like, how do I get all my people to do all the things? And how do I create for the people where they are? Right. Yeah. And I, I really hope that that, you know, it's funny. I, I've reflected myself about different places when I've tried to you know, be like, okay, this social platform has all these users and, you know, do I want to create content for those people? And I think you really have to have a, you know, a come to whatever you worship moment. <laughs> a come to deity moment. Yeah, exactly. Where you're like, how desperate am I? Where I'm willing to completely change who I am as an artist and what I create as an artist to, you know, maybe get the eyeballs of said people and quote unquote blow up, right? Like, why are we chasing those things? And I, I, I really do hope that the social platforms just, you know, duplicate like rabbits so that we no longer have to feel the pressure of that because we shouldn't be feeling desperate for eyeballs. We know how to get eyeballs, you know? Yeah. We know how to target in advertising. Some advertising platforms suck. Uh, TikTok ads suck. If I haven't said that, yeah. um, I, and I have run tests and it sucks. <laughs> you can target yeah. music. That's it. Not rock music, <laughs> not pop so music, bad. just music <laughs> as an interest. It's like, okay. So right now, right? Which that could change, but I know how to run Snapchat ads. I know how to run Twitter ads. I know how to run Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, and they're all doing different things, but I know how to chase eyeballs. I do it by putting my money where my mouth is, you know, and I issue content on those different platforms that make sense. And if I don't want to make content for something like TikTok, then I just don't because it's fine. So I hope that in 2021, there's such a variety of options that we no longer have to desperately chase whatever certain social platform and instead chase content that we love to create and the audience who will naturally accept it. Yeah, I love that. I think that that sums up my hopes as well. <laughs> Perfect. So that is our predictions for 2021. If you want to prep for greatness in 2021, go to entrepreneur.io slash services and check out all the things we plugged at the beginning of this episode. Uh, otherwise, we will see you out there. We are taking a break next week because, OMG, let's get ready for this year. But super looking forward to talking with you all again in a couple weeks. Have a wonderful New Year, Indies. Yeah, we'll see you guys soon. Happy, happy New Year. <laughs>